the name of the King of Kings. This morning, we will focus on the Gospel reading taken from the second chapter of St. Matthew. Make no mistake, the situation was dire. A brutal madman sat upon the throne of David. This man, King Herod, was absolutely obsessed with maintaining his rule over Israel. So much so that he assassinated the, um, the members of all rival factions, including, including his own wife, Marianne. He even executed his own sons in a fit of rage and paranoia. And now, now with foreigners like the Magi coming and investigating and searching for a true king of the Jews, his rage would soon become a blazing inferno of hatred. You see, the only thing that made Herod fit to rule was his family's connection to Julius Caesar and the Emperor Augustus. Herod and his family were not of the Davidic line of kings at all. In fact, they weren't even Jewish. They were Edomites, who, in order to rule, had to have an official stamp from the Roman government to make them official. Now, if you remember, Edomites were descendants of Isaac's son Esau, who traded his birthright for food. King David and his chosen lineage rose from the line of Jacob, Esau's younger and far more wily brother. And certainly had God wanted to, he could have sent an angelic host to wipe out this psychotic leader and all the satanic forces at his disposal who sought to kill our Savior in his fragile state. But God doesn't often work that way, does he? No, he chose to use Joseph, the foster father of our Lord, to move Jesus and Mary into a foreign land to seek safety. Joseph was no battle-hardened warrior. He had, hadn't been gifted with immeasurable strength like Samson. He was no prophet who could call down fire from heaven. Joseph was a, a humble laborer, a builder, who in his humility sought to live an upright life according to the scriptures. This man, this normal, hard-working, faithful, good, and humble man, was who God in heaven sought to keep his only begotten son safe against the seemingly insurmountable tide of evil rising against them. And when the angel appeared to Joseph the second time, he instructed Joseph, Rise, rise and take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt. And remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child, to destroy him. And he rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt. Thanks be to God, Joseph obeyed. Because we read that the tyrant Herod killed a multitude of children in the region for only a chance to crush any, any challenge to his rule. The Magi, having correctly diagnosed the king's psychosis and thirst for power, chose not to, to visit Herod's court on their return back after they had found that little savior in Bethlehem. Their gift of gold, in fact, assisted the Holy Family in escaping his demonic plans. Joseph, much like Joseph we find in Genesis, the most favored son of Jacob, led his family to safety, to refuge, to peace in Egypt. This everyday man, this faithful man, who simply believed and obeyed, played a pivotal role in God's plan to save all mankind from sin, from death, and the devil. And when the time came, when that tyrant died, 
Joseph once again obeyed and left the security that they had found in Egypt. And they moved back to the promised land where the Lord's will would be done and fulfilled in Jesus. God often works in common means. God uses whomever and whatever he chooses to direct us toward himself. God chooses simple, everyday things like water that when combined with the word of God can have the power to wash away sins. God uses simple bread and wine, food, to heal broken hearts, to forgive sins, and to empower the church to face all that this fallen world may throw at it. God calls men from all walks of life to serve as the shepherds of our church, the very bride of Christ, to guide them along the paths of righteousness towards life eternal, our promised land with the Lamb in heaven. God uses you, dear brothers and sisters. You aren't likely born of princes and kings. You aren't likely the son of a judge, of a senator, or a president. Still, God uses you and your humble faithfulness to be mighty servants of the King of Kings. You all minister to the church and the Lord, certainly here in Richmond, Virginia, but across the entire synod as well. You serve as the voice of truth that enlightens the darkness for the masses. Your hard work, your endless generosity, serves so many in need here and elsewhere, including a little place called Fort Wayne, Indiana. Let's use my family as an example, shall we? When we first came to you here, battered by the world and its evil state, you offered us refuge, a place of safety among those with faithful hearts and big hugs. Here among you all, we heard the gospel rightly preached. The seeds you have sown among us led our children to the baptismal font. Our children were confirmed with you as their witnesses. And when the time was right, as God called us to work in the church ourselves, you have been our unwavering support as we've sadly had to move away from you here in our true home. Be assured, dear friends, as Stephanie and I struggle through the rigors of having a double portion of work, reading thousands of pages of the most interesting theological tomes, writing endless papers, working in the field, and visiting the sick and homebound. We have you, you in our hearts, as you do us. And someday, when we are called to a congregation to serve, we pray that the seeds that you have sown in us begin to flourish and blossom in earnest. As we also begin to minister to God's people, wherever we may be called. You, you have played and will continue to play a significant role in mine and Stephanie's ministries. Bethlehem, the city of David, was Joseph's home. He had roots there. His family was there. He and Mary had decided to build their family there, to live among his kinsmen. Bethlehem, which means house of bread, had sustained him and his small family with the benefit of friendship, of livelihood, of tribal affinity, 
and sustenance of the physical and spiritual kinds. Having the angel call him out of his home would have been a difficult command to, to follow. Yet, that simple, faithful, and obedient man listened to the word of God and did what was necessary. The need was real. The situation was dire. But he answered God's call. We, too, have called Bethlehem our home. Our deep roots here, they still remain. We built our own clan with you here in this place, wrapped within and protected by your wings. You are our tribe. You are our kinsmen. United with the waters of baptism, and we share a common table with you. And by your work, by the Holy Spirit, the seeds of your labor have taken root in our hearts. And thus we too were called out of Bethlehem. Now, an angel did not come to us in a dream, but the Spirit still calls us by the word preached from this very pulpit every Sunday, by the very breath of our old pastor. We were strengthened at that same altar which, with which we shared our meals with you. And in those simple, common means, God has used you and your witness for the cause of Christ to be the catalyst that encouraged us to serve the church. The word for angel means messenger in the common language. So in that way, you were God's messengers, his angels to us. And make no mistake, the situation is dire. The need for pastors and church workers in our synod has never been more pertinent. It's kind of defeating at the annual call service this year. It was announced that of all the congregations who had requested a, to call a pastor from, the, from both of the synod seminaries, 40, 40 of those calls would go unanswered because there just aren't enough men to call. And of course, there's others out there who are looking to seek calls from the field as well, but that's at least 40 congregations without a shepherd. That's 40 congregations who would not have someone to preach the word to them. They would have no one to administer the sacraments. And while caring for the flock is an essential role for pastors, it's also his job to beat back the wolves which surround his flock. And with the state of our world, it is even more crucial. In fact, if you really listen, if we stop and listen, we can hear the howls of this world to forsake Christ and to follow the wayward path to destruction. Fear not, my friends, for God is faithful. Our God uses common means. He uses everyday people, like Joseph, like me, and like you. And by his power, not our own, murderous kings, the devil, sin, and death itself falls to their knees in subjugation to the king of kings. Let us all be thankful and pray that God continues to bless us and that the seeds that have been sown will grow and thrive according to his gracious will. In the blessed name of Jesus, amen.